they had a hard, hard time. It, it, it was so competitive that I think that back then that they may have been very difficult for a black lady. That voice you just heard was the late wrestling legend Rowdy Roddy Piper weighing in on the status of women in the wrestling industry. That interview with Piper is featured in the documentary Lady Wrestler, the amazing untold story of African American women in the ring, which is now streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Lady Wrestler tells the story of courageous black women who broke racial and gender boundaries in pro wrestling in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. I'm Chris Borne and I directed the documentary. And this podcast, Lady Wrestler, the story behind the story, gives you a behind the scenes look at the issues explored in the documentary. Getting to interview Rowdy Roddy Piper was a really cool experience. I met him at Days of the Dead, a horror and sci-fi convention in Indianapolis, which is about a three hour drive west of my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. Columbus became the birthplace of women's wrestling in the 1930s. Piper was at Days of the Dead for a cast reunion and panel discussion for the cult horror sci-fi action movie They Live, directed by John Carpenter, famous for inventing the modern day horror genre with the Halloween franchise. The convention took place in July 2013 two years before Piper's untimely death from a heart attack at age 61. Although I had never met Piper before, I did have a history with him, so to speak. He's one of the reasons I became a wrestling fan. As a kid in middle school in Columbus, I'd watch cable TV in the rec room of the home of my grandparents, Bob and Pearl Borne. I turned the station to WTBS, which played WWF wrestling matches in the 80s. <laughs> While the WWF superstars played on my grandparents' big, old-fashioned floor model TV, I'd put down a big, oversized pillow on the floor and throw myself around, imitating the acrobatic moves of tough guys like Piper and Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant and Randy Savage. Savage, I later found out, was a native of Columbus, like me. So imagine how excited I was when I got a chance to meet Rowdy Roddy Piper. After randomly coming across the Days of the Dead convention, while surfing the internet and seeing that Piper was going to be there, I grabbed my camera, jumped in my car, and hightailed it to Indianapolis one Saturday. Since I was in the middle of making Lady Wrestler, I figured I'd approach Piper and ask him for an interview. As I said before, I'd never met this wrestling legend. And on top of that, I'm extremely shy, especially around strangers. I had no idea if Piper would give me the time of day, but to my pleasant surprise, my childhood idol was totally approachable. After attending the They Live panel discussion and standing in a long line at his booth behind people waiting to get his autograph, I shook his hand, told him about Lady Wrestler, and asked if he'd be willing to sit for an interview. Piper was totally cool said he remembered the African-American lady wrestlers from the era in which I was chronicling in the documentary and agreed to speak with me. But there was one catch. Piper told me to come back the next day, a Sunday, the final day of the convention when the lines of autograph seekers would likely have thinned out and he'd have a little more time to do the interview. Well, there was another catch. I promised a musician friend of mine back in Columbus that I'd attend his concert that night. So I hopped in my car again and drove the three hours back to my hometown for the show. 
and then I drove back to Indianapolis the next day to interview Piper. I ran up hundreds of miles in my car, and luckily my beat-up Honda Accord was reliable. But after all that time on the road, my head was so discombobulated that I left my front door standing wide open. Fortunately, my neighbor called to tell me she'd noticed me leaving in a hurry and graciously closed my front door. Whew. When I made it back to the hotel where the Days of the Dead convention was being held, it was Sunday morning, and a local Indianapolis church had rented out one of the hotel's conference rooms to hold their weekly service. Now, keep in mind that Days of the Dead is a horror sci-fi convention, so hearing gospel music wafting out of one of the conference rooms while in the hallways of the hotel, horror and sci-fi fans walked around dressed up literally as ghouls and goblins was a bit disconcerting to say the least. Finally, I met up again with Rowdy Roddy Piper, and he was very forthcoming and easy to talk to. Here's what he had to say about black women in the wrestling industry. They had a hard, hard time. It, it, it was so competitive that I think that back then that they may have been very difficult for a black lady. When they got on the mat, they had to perform and hit harder and they were rougher on each other than we were because there was, there was so much male dominance and they were always treated as just, you know, flash, where these women would, were really trying to get over as the guys were and being world champion and recognizing their talents. Getting to meet Rowdy Roddy Piper, especially since he passed away at a relatively young age, was one of the most memorable experiences of making Lady Wrestler. Another memorable experience was attending the big independent wrestling tournament, WrestleCon, in Orlando, Florida in April 2017. You know, I must admit that after I became a wrestling fan in middle school, I sort of lost touch with it as I came of age. And by late 2005, when I began interviewing the legends featured in Lady Wrestler, wrestling was actually the furthest thing from my mind. In fact, when I finished editing a rough cut of Lady Wrestler in 2017, I realized I had never been to a wrestling match in person. I'd only seen it on TV. So I ventured to WrestleCon and attended a women's wrestling tournament to see firsthand the sport that I had just made an entire movie about. Attending WrestleCon it was beneficial that I was somewhat detached from the wrestling industry. I was able to see the forest for the trees, and as a detached observer, I noticed that between each match, men in the audience rushed up to the female wrestlers and took selfies with them and high-fived them. Here's an excerpt from the video diary I made while attending the event. The audience was pretty mixed, male and female. Um, it was diverse race-wise in the audience. And the men were actually going wild for the women. Um, even when the women wrestled men, the men in the audience were rooting for the women to, to win. The show is fantastic. You know, there was just so many great things taking place all at the same time. It's just there was a lot of women. They were hitting each other. There was a lot of screaming. Uh, a lot of just craziness going on. There was just so much. My mind was like blown. That last comment you heard after the excerpt from my video diary was from a fan named Billy B about what he enjoyed about the women's wrestling tournament. I found it extremely interesting that women's wrestling seems to be one of, if not the only sport, in which women are the main attraction, but the fan base is predominantly male. After the women's tournament, I interviewed some of the male fans in attendance. Here's what a fan named Jordan Williams had to say. Oh, and please excuse the less than ideal audio quality, as these interviews were conducted outside of a noisy arena. And there's definitely a different 
kind of immersion to women's wrestling, too, which is what I like. Um, so I'm big on women's wrestling. Just because, and I don't think they get the, the credit that the men do. And here's more commentary from the fan named Billy B. I, I think there's definitely been like a revolution taking place where women now can actually be appreciated for the wrestling, not just based on looks. For more insight into why men appreciate women's wrestling, here's my interview with Chris Bergstrom, who operates the popular Facebook page, Fabulous Ladies of Wrestling. Since you're such an advocate of uh, wrestling and such a, it seems like you have like such a vast knowledge of the history of wrestling. I just want to kind of find out like, when did you first get into wrestling? What was your first, um, do you have like a first memory of seeing a match or seeing one on TV? Okay. So my first ever experience with professional wrestling was probably as young as like five years old. Um, my brother, he was a big wrestling fan. He was a few years older than me, and he collected all of the VHS tapes back then. So I'd actually watch a lot of the older stuff while, you know, everyone was fans of, say, like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. I'd be watching tapes from the 80s and stuff and watching Hogan and Andre and Macho Man and I was really into that, and uh, I always was curious about the history, and that was what really fascinated me, and um, especially women's wrestling. I remember Leilani Kai versus the Fabulous Moolah, and it was a WrestleMania, and I thought that was just so cool to see women out there, you know, competing against each other, and... Um, I wanted to know more. It's like back then there was only, you know, maybe four or five women that were even wrestling regularly. So it's like uh, they have 30, 40, 50 men on the roster and only a few women. So I was curious, well, isn't there more, <laughs> you know? And, and this was and, like what, this was what time period? So when I uh, really started watching was probably around, 93. Okay. Um, but uh, I always had a deep appreciation for the history of wrestling. And as I got older was when I really, you know, started looking at matches from, you know, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And it was, uh, I um, started, you know, really getting into research of the women wrestlers and it always fascinated me you know their experience of you know becoming wrestlers and how much harder it had to have been for them in a male dominated sport and uh it was just something i really uh enjoyed and i wanted you know to make sure when i started uh i started my <laughs> my side and stuff on a Facebook group and I wanted to dedicate it to the history of women's wrestling and show appreciation to these women who did so much in the early days and who made it possible for the women today, you know, to really go out there. How do you find a lot of the um, old photos and stuff that you post on your, on your Facebook page? Okay. So I've, became friends with a lot of the uh, photographers and and I've actually befriended a lot of the retired lady wrestlers and it's so fascinating hearing their stories and stuff and like I really was a huge fan of Lipstick and Dynamite the mm -hmm. documentary done yeah and it was so cool to see you know these women, you know, my grandma's age and they've been talking about their history and how hard it was for them to get into the business. And then, you know, watching your documentary, Lady Wrestler, and, you know, seeing these three sisters who became wrestlers. And it's really fascinating to learn how many like sisters we're in wrestling. It's like something you wouldn't really think, but you know, there was the Wingo sisters 
Um, Mel Stewart, she had a sister named Maddie Bell that was a wrestler. Uh, Kathy Branch, who was a wrestler, she had a sister named Rusty Ryan, and they were wrestlers. And uh, Wilma Gordon and Mae Weston, who were two of Mildred Burke's top rivals in the 40s, and they were sisters. And this was all kept a secret, you know, it wasn't well known that these were sisters, they were going against each other in all of their matches and no one knew and until, you know, documentaries such as yours let it be known. <laughs> I mean, of course, people in the business do, but. Right. Yeah, do you, from, from what you've, um, from what some of the, the lady wrestlers have told you, did the fact that they had, you know, a sibling in the industry, did that, offer them protection, you know, because some of the women were exploited and had, you know, bad experiences. Did the fact that they, you know, they were sisters, did they help, help protect each other? Yeah. You know, um, they were actually encouraged to recruit uh, okay. by Billy Wolf. He, yeah. you know, wanted more women on his roster. He could never have enough women on his troop, so he'd always want them to bring in more. So ask your sister, ask your neighbor, ask your cousin, you know, and there'd be all these different connections. Uh, I'm uh, friends with a lot of the family members of some of the lady wrestlers too, and there was uh, two other sisters, Patty Neff and Elaine Ellis, and I'm friends with their sisters on Facebook, and they've shared a lot of stories, and they wanted to get their mother and their aunt's story out there, too. And it's been really cool, the stuff that they've shared with me as well. What do you think is the best way to, like, commemorate these women? Because, like, you know, I did the documentary. You have your site, which is great. What do you think should – do you think just, like, more – we need, like, a – more, more of the women to be inducted into halls of fame or what, what's the best way to like commemorate their legacy and their contributions to wrestling? I think, you know, as long as their names out there after what, 30, 40, 50 years since they have been wrestling, that's huge. You know, there's a lot of, you know, actors and actresses and stuff from that time who are unknown and stuff too now. And that's very similar with wrestling. Um, before documentaries such as, you know, yours, a lot of people wouldn't have known who uh, uh, Lula Mae Provo was. Yeah. Or, you know, even some of them wouldn't have ever known the three sisters either just because they didn't really know the wrestling history. There's so many times I've talked to a lot of current wrestling fans and all get really excited talking about what I'm doing with my uh, history of women's wrestling, and sharing, uh, hey, I talked to Mildred Burke's granddaughter. It was so cool, you know? And they're like, who? <laughs> How can you not know who Mildred Burke is yeah. and be a wrestling fan, especially of women's wrestling? And she was like one of the pioneers as well. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have like a favorite, like one in particular, one favorite wrestler of all time? Either? So, yeah, I do actually, but it, it's it's kind of hard to say a favorite, but I'll okay. say one that stood out okay. the most was probably like a Luna Vachon, just because she was this like scary woman. She had half her head shaved. She had a tattoo on the side of her head and she was just really unique you could tell that she was actually a really good wrestler too and um it was unfortunate she never really got the fame she deserved either she because you know by the time she really started to become famous uh WWE had gone the route of the divas and you know being more interested in who's the prettiest or whatever, you know, like that, they'd have those type of matches. And it's like, it was no longer about the athleticism or, you know, the abilities. It was just, you know, but she yeah. was really cool. <laughs> cool. Well, so you mentioned, you know, WWE divas. And so what's your opinion of, you know, overall of, of modern 
women's wrestling? What do you, what do you think of it? Are you fans of anyone? Like any? So I definitely think there is talented wrestlers there, but it's definitely so different now than it was, you know, even just 20 years ago. It's so different. It's more about the show. You know, it's not really as much about the match. People are so much more entertained by what happened backstage and some silly segment of someone attacks someone backstage or, uh, you know, this woman is cheating on her husband with this other guy. And it's just so much of a show. It's not really about what happens in the ring as much. Yeah, it sounds like it's more about like sensationalism to like, you know, keep people entertained more so yeah. than just watching the match. Like you said, it's like they have to have these outrageous storylines and all these antics and stuff because they think people don't yeah. want to come and just see the match. But there, there is some really talented women wrestlers too today, like Charlotte Flair and Bianca Belair, mm-hmm. uh, Naomi, and, and they're there you can tell that they're kind of a combination of both the showmanship and the wrestler it's but it's no longer just wrestling like the, the shows even called world wrestling entertainment now you know so entertainment is the focal point yeah and you know as you know with my documentary the women i interviewed ethel johnson ethel brown and ramona isbell all said that exact same thing that you just said. It's it's that it's yeah, more yeah. about the show and that what they were in it, it was more they still had the show aspect of it, but it was more about like you, you know, like you said, knowing the holds and the the more athletic part yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So before we had, you know, before everything was locked down with COVID, would you go to wrestling matches and stuff a lot? Yeah, um, not as frequently as I did when I was younger, but I went to uh, NXT TakeOver in Portland uh, last year, and it was it was a really good show, and I enjoyed it, but I enjoy a lot of the stuff, like, outside of the WWE. Mm-hmm. Like, I enjoy AEW and um, Impact, because I feel like they focus more on actual women's wrestling and, and not as much of the characters and all of that. Would you ever go to um, wrestling conventions and like, you know, because I'm sure it's some of the conventions that they used to have before COVID that you could find memorabilia and meet a lot of the um, the older wrestlers and stuff at some of the conventions. I've okay. always wanted to, like, uh, I wanted to go to like the Cauliflower Alley Club and uh stuff like that and um back in the 90s they used to have uh the liwa which was um ran by moolah and may young and it was literally a reunion of retired female wrestlers and it had everyone from clara mortensen to donna cristinello margaret garcia pretty much all of these women from various times it was really cool and i have a friend um, matt langley who went to a lot of the shows and he sent me a lot of the memorabilia and stuff it's really cool to have were you into glow at all the the netflix series i have not watched it honestly (laughs) um I've, I've heard it was good. I just I just haven't had a chance to watch it yet, no. Yeah, and I know it hasn't. I know it's been canceled, but I think the the three seasons that they did, I think it's still available on Netflix. Oh, yeah. It, yeah definitely I, on I watched, the list to watch eventually. <laughs> what'd you say? I said it's definitely on the list to watch eventually. I, right, yeah. And I, I mean, I watched the pilot episode just to say I watched it because back when I was first, when I had first finished Lady Wrestler back in whatever, 2017 or 2018, people would always, that's when Glow was first coming on, the mm-hmm. Netflix version of Glow. And people were always asking me, oh, what do you think of Glow and comparing Lady Wrestler to Glow? So I was like, I need to see this show just to say I've seen it. And I thought it was entertaining. The thing about Glow is they portray the women as just basically actresses, like actresses yeah. who were hired to basically play the part of a wrestler, not 
Oh yeah. You know, not not wrestlers who are trying to get famous or trying to you know further their career or you know trying to make a name for themselves. It's basically like the lead character was basically like an out of work actress who stumbled into this to you know yeah. better than waiting tables or whatever. So, but I I thought and it was I, an entertaining show. Yeah. I and did I also, watch the original Glow. So, yes, I've you know, actually no, no, the no, one I've never actually seen the original on. Glow. And I watched the documentary that's that was on Netflix. I don't know if it's there anymore, but it's a really good documentary. They interview all of the different ladies who were there. And really that show, I think, is what made WWE go into that direction of showmanship for their women and uh, more about the characters. I think they did kind of take from Glow a lot because these were not professionally trained wrestlers, really, in Glow. They were usually actresses, and a lot of them became good wrestlers, but most all of them had zero wrestling experience before Okay, so that yeah. so the so the Netflix series, the most recent Netflix series, and I guess they were just kind of the reason why they showed the the characters being actresses is because it was like they were it was like that's how the the original yeah character. they had paddle calls just like you know for acting and stuff and they had a bunch of women and there was actually professional lady wrestlers who went to try out for the original bow and uh -huh. they were turned down. That's interesting because they didn't think they so, were like because they didn't care at all if they could wrestle. They just wanted them to have a character ready. Okay. And, yeah. So they, Luna Vachon was one that was actually turned down from the original flow. And it's like she wow. was one of the the most accomplished wrestlers of her generation. So it's like, why would they not want her? But it's because they didn't want necessarily known wrestlers. Yeah, and then probably they also probably wanted someone who was like a blank slate that they someone who wasn't like already yeah. trained and like had a certain style. They probably oh, wanted yeah. someone that they could just kind of like teach from scratch. That um, yeah, exactly. you know, like and like you said, that didn't already have like a fan base that would be expecting certain things from them. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be able to like train the train the wrestlers from scratch. Yeah, you know, you mentioned you met Mildred Burks. Would you say granddaughter? I yeah I had her I had talked to her on Facebook that's uh -huh. uh, actually where I've gotten a hold of a lot of because I've found a lot of the, the families and stuff that I've contacted they don't have a lot of the photos yeah. that a lot of the media has yeah. or you know collectors and they're shocked that some of the photos even exist yeah, like I, I interviewed Valerie Hawes, Lula Mae Provo's daughter, and she, she said, she said, my mom didn't have a lot of memorabilia. I, she had maybe one photo, and she was like, you have the other photo I've seen. Yeah. So it's, just, <laughs> it's, just, it's just weird that I don't know if like the women, what, I mean, what's your, what's your opinion? Why, did, why don't the women in their families have the memorabilia? I think once a lot of the women left wrestling, that was it. Okay. They probably had some of it originally okay. and they got rid of it. You know, maybe they just left it wherever they were or they sold it to a collector or a fan. And so their kids never saw it. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who have started trying to collect stuff now um, that their mother had and, you know, gave away. And I don't know if you've read a whole lot on uh, uh, Sweet Georgia Brown, but her son actually said in an interview that um, his, I don't know if it was his uncle, but he burnt her robes and all oh, of her wow. memorabilia. Like, so there was nothing from her career that her, her son and her daughters had because they wanted, you know, they were not, I think a lot of the women were not really wanting to be wrestlers. Yeah. They just knew they could make money at it. Yeah. And they were athletic. A lot of them had sports backgrounds and were in basketball or whatever in high school. And 
they thought, why not give it a shot? You know, they probably ran into someone and they said, Hey, come to the gym and give it a try. And once they, you know, <laughs> made some money, they were like, okay, yeah, this, this is for me. But then when they went back home, they probably didn't really talk about it or, you know, they, it seems like a lot of them, it was their dark secret. A lot of the older lady wrestlers. Yeah. And that would probably explain part of the reason why Moolah has gotten so much attention because she wasn't ashamed of her history in, no. in wrestling. And she, I mean, she was boastful about it. So she was one of the few women yeah. who, who really promoted herself. Yeah, and I think that's where the difference is because Moolah, you know, she was legitimately a fan of mm -hmm. wrestling, you know, and mm -hmm. she wanted to be a wrestler and she wanted to beat Mildred Burke. <laughs> she never even got a chance to wrestle Mildred Burke, but um, she wanted, and, and that's another thing. There are so many rivalries <laughs> in wrestling yes. and it's like, you think that it's only, in, no, no. Uh, I've heard stories from different people who hosted the reunions and stuff and uh, Mildred Burke and Moolah, they would never go to any reunion the other with that. So oh, if wow. Mildred Burke was booked, Moolah wouldn't be there. Moolah was booked, Burke would not be there. And Sounds like, like um, the comparison that comes to my mind is Joan Crawford and Betty Davis. Yes, <laughs> that is the perfect comparison. And it's like, and they are legitimately probably the two biggest well-known names, you know, in wrestling. Right. Or women's wrestling. So right, it's right. like, and for them to hate each other, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, it's like. And a lot of the people who were trained by Moolah and the ones that were trained by Billy Wolf or Mildred Burke, they didn't really have a lot of overlap where they wrestled against each other. It was, it was all wrestling. Moolah's girls for the people trained by Moolah and uh, Billy Wolf's girls. Like Ethel Johnson, as far as I know, I don't think she ever really fought like sweet georgia brown who was one of moolah's girls yeah it's it seemed, it definitely seemed like they were on different circuits like they didn't yeah. they didn't um like you said they didn't have the same um the same matches they weren't on the same cards definitely it seems like there was a concerted effort to to i don't know if it was a concerted effort or it was just that's the way the um the industry was that different promoters had different circuits yeah back in the day yeah, so um, do you have any plans to uh, expand your page or do you have any, any new projects coming up? Yes, or? so I've actually been kind of silently working on a project for the last few years or so, and that's actually cataloging all of the women wrestlers wow. and like making an encyclopedia. And I've gotten a lot of help from different collectors and photographers. And it's like, I want all of them, you know, listed. I don't want to forget one that had, you know, just a year in wrestling. So that way their names are all known <laughs> if someone buys the book or even if it's just a, uh, you know, um, an ebook or something on online it's still all of their names and a little brief history like i'm actually a genealogist and i do family history and it's like i've done a lot of the research and i know where to look so i've done a lot of research for the women wrestlers as well and, and it's kind of cool to see their full story you know you only know so much by uh, looking at the newspaper clippings or the magazine articles, which a lot of them were kind of fictionalized. Sure. They wouldn't be from the place they were listed as being from. Uh, their names, a lot of the ladies didn't go by it. their real names. Sure. There were some that did. but Or they'd have like Ethel, like she had her real first name, but a different last yes. name. Yeah. Yeah. But what? yeah, I've, I've found a lot of really interesting information and it's like, I've shared with a lot of the, you know, older 
researchers and stuff and they didn't know this information <laughs> and it's really cool and kind of satisfying to know that I'm that good of a researcher to be able and I have like Greg Oliver who's one of the most respected journalists in wrestling and he has actually had me helping him uh, with research and finding information like for the longest time he could not find information as to what happened to a lady wrestler named Alma Mills. Mm -hmm. She just kind of disappeared. They knew that she lived in Baltimore, Maryland, and they knew she became a barber after wrestling, but they didn't know a real name. They didn't know, you know, uh, an estimated birth date. And finally he found the last name. And from there I had all the information for him the next day. <laughs> Cool. And he, he's got an article ready to publish here soon. Well, Chris, I really commend you on that. That's, that's something that's long overdue. And I just appreciate all you're doing to help preserve the legacy of these women. Thank so many you. of them, unfortunately, have been forgotten. And I just so, so appreciate everything you've done to help promote Lady Wrestler, just bringing awareness to women yeah. like Ethel and her sisters and Ramona. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, I just really, really appreciate everything you're doing. On the next edition of Lady Wrestler, the story behind the story, we'll explore who was Billy Wolf? Did the famous, or should I say infamous, wrestling promoter who was widely credited with lifting women's wrestling out of the circus sideshows and making the sport a mainstream attraction, empower women or exploit women? We'll hear from two wrestling legends who were promoted by Billy Wolf. Two ladies who both happen to be named Ethel. Ethel Johnson. In that business, it was hard breaking into it, being blind, because nobody really wanted you. I think Billy Wolf, the manager that I had, was the only one that wanted you. And Ethel Brown. He wanted three women who were more like the Hollywood type. Join us for the next edition of Lady Wrestler, the story behind the story. Please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to catch the documentary on Amazon Prime Video. Thank you for listening. Catch you next time.